Mr. Booker. Mr. Secretary, it's good to Senator. see you. And I want to thank you again for having uh, members of this committee over uh, to the State Department. I thought it was a really productive conversation. Uh, I just want to jump in uh, first and foremost just about food security in general. Uh, the Black Sea Grain Initiative was extended on March 18th. Uh, it gives me a lot of hope, but for only 60 days, unfortunately. And half of that time period uh, stipulated, uh, really, in the original agreement, makes me some, have some concerns. Uh, relief agencies themselves, as you know, have been expressing disappointment in the shortened duration, stressing that a lot of the countries in East Africa uh, um, will be entering the lean season and have a lot of crises. I know negotiations to allow for the safe passage of commercial ships carrying Ukrainian agricultural exports from the Black Sea have really been facing challenges. We know that uh, the Russians are uh, doing a lot of things to slow down the processes. They've created backlogs, uh, and there's been a, a significant drop. I know you're aware of all this. Can you just help uh, me better understand uh, the importance of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, uh, how the administration is working to ensure Russia fully meets uh, its obligations, and have you started to work with other countries dependent upon Russia yeah. and, and Ukraine grain to become more uh, food sovereign and independent? Yeah. So uh, a couple of things. Thank you, Senator, for raising that. Um, it's hard to overstate the importance of the uh, Black Sea Grain Corridor. As you know uh, well, Ukraine uh, had been, before the Russian aggression, uh, one of the main breadbaskets of the world, including um, Africa. Um, and the, one of the results of the Russian aggression, of course, was to uh, disrupt significantly its export of grain of wheat. The Black Sea Grain Corridor has been um, a – it never should have been necessary in the first place because it was only necessary because Russia was blocking exports out of Ukraine, blocking the port of Odessa. But uh, once put in place, was a significant success, uh, getting out about 24 million metric tons uh, of grain uh, uh, from Ukraine, uh, the equivalent of 8 billion loaves of bread. Uh, the vast majority of that was going to the Global South. Uh, it's had a direct impact. By the way, when I was just in Ethiopia, I saw large bags – sacks of Ukrainian uh, grain that were there as a result of the Black Sea uh, Grain Corridor Initiative. So it's imperative that uh, it be um, sustained. Uh, there is a renewal, but uh, the Russians continue to manipulate it and play with it. The number of ships, as you mentioned, that are actually allowed to go through, uh, they have been uh, playing games with so that uh, the, the number of ships is, is smaller. Uh, we're pushing every day on the, on the UN uh, and with the UN and others to make sure that not only is it sustained, but uh, it's allowed to operate efficiently and effectively. However, even with that, um, we have been seized with the uh, global food crisis and global in food insecurity in two ways, uh, and, and very quickly. One is, of course, dealing with the emergency problem that so many countries are facing. Over the last year, we provided, on top of what we were already doing, an additional $13.5 billion uh, in, to advance um, uh, food security around the world and to deal with emergency situations. We're by far the largest donor to the World Food Program. We pr provide about 50 percent of its budget. And, and do you think that the fiscal year uh, 2024 mm -hmm. request of, I think it's about $5 billion, yep. if I'm getting this right, is, is that enough? Uh, so uh, I want to say at this point, I, I believe it is, but this is um, a, you know, a perfect storm in so many ways that could, that could get worse. So we want to make sure that we retain the, the, the flexibility. We have the Feed the Future Program, which is dealing with the longer term aspect of this, which is well funded and uh, is in the budget, this is helping countries actually build their own sustainable productive capacity, not just have to rely on emergency assistance. Can I dig deeper in your recent trip to Ethiopia? Yeah. You, you said that both sides have been uh, uh, guilty, really, of war crimes. We see a nation that is going to have a lot of challenges ahead of it. Um, millions of people are in need of assistance mm -hmm. right now, and the security situation remains volatile and it will probably be contributed uh, to that insecurity will, will be the, the, the sheer needs of the populations. Um, uh, I, I know the administration is working with UN and other partners to, to meet the, this unbelievable humanitarian crisis, but I guess I want to ask you is, um, are we putting enough resources, the, I guess the FY24 budget requests $286 million for Ethiopia and $331 million for new humanitarian assistance? Uh, I'm just curious, as you engage with people on the ground, mm -hmm. are we doing enough in terms of helping that country get up off its knees after this horrific uh, crisis and humanitarian crisis? So, um, uh, one, I believe that, uh, that we are, but I also believe and hope that we'll actually be able to do more. And partly that is dependent on 
um, Ethiopia following through on the usually important agreement that was reached for the cessation of hostilities in Tigray. Um, uh, we, we're not erasing the last couple of years, and in fact, as you, as you noted, we just announced the other day uh, that uh, it's our assessment that all sides have committed uh, atrocities, uh, and we detail those. But the agreement that was reached has resulted in this. The guns are silent, humanitarian assistance is flowing to the north, services are being restored, uh, the Eritreans have pulled back and are pulling out. Um, the uh, TPLF has put down its heavy weapons. They're standing up an interim administration. And there is the beginnings of a transitional justice process in place that Prime Minister Abiy is, um, uh, is supporting and advancing. What I, what I told him when I saw him was, as they move down this road and implement the very important decisions we've made, that will allow us and presumably allow Congress to support uh, greater renewed engagement with Ethiopia, uh, greater renewed support, both in terms of our own assistance programs, um, some of which, uh, now I will say, despite the, the last two years, when, when it comes to basic humanitarian assistance in Ethiopia, we've sustained uh, virtually all of it. But there are other things uh, that can be done on an economic level that would really benefit uh, Ethiopia. And as it travels this path of um, peace, of um, accountability, uh, of uh, reconciliation, uh, we'll be able to do that. The international financial institutions as well are looking at how they can re-engage. Can I just really quickly, I know it's a priority for you about uh, diversity and inclusion, and I really appreciate the conversations we've had since before you were even confirmed. Uh, uh, in July, a GAO report analyzing the department's uh, DEIA practices uh, provided a lot of recommendations mm -hmm. in short. Um, can you speak to how the department plans to, to uh, continue to use the funding requested for the DIA office and how the department's implementation uh, to these kind of priorities is going to go forward? And again, has the work that you've been doing uh, in your retention unit inform your department's budget request for priorities. Can you, can you just give me some more? Yes, in fact, so the, uh, and thank you for raising the retention unit. First, let me just say very quickly, um, this has been from day one, and it goes back, um, Mr. Chairman, to um, when this committee was uh, uh, good enough to, to confirm me. I made a commitment that um, I would be, uh, I would see uh, a marker of my success or not in this job, whether or not the institution made uh, real progress in building an institution that actually reflects the country that we're there to, to represent. So this has been a, a priority of mine from day one. Uh, we established the office of the CDIO, the uh, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Office. Never had that before. Reports directly to me. We have a five-year strategic plan that was put in place. We have, for the first time, disaggregated data that looks across every office of the department so we have a clear picture of where we are and uh, where we're not. We have senior officers from every bureau at the Deputy Assistant Secretary level who are assigned to carry this portfolio in their bureaus from the very beginning of the pipeline to the end of the pipeline. That is from recruitment all the way to promotion uh, and advancement with a retention in the middle. Uh, we are intensely uh, focused. We're trying to open more um, uh, hearts and minds to the idea of serving uh, in government um, and serving hopefully at the State Department. I've done that directly uh, myself, as senior officials have. Retention, though, is a critical piece because what we found is we get people through the door at C Street, but then they don't stay, and disproportionately, uh, the people who don't stay tend to be from uh, groups that have been historically underrepresented at the department. So we need to understand why. And part of that it was setting up a retention unit where we have been engaged in interviewing everyone who is uh, willing, who is, has, was leaving the department or thinking about leaving the department, as well as doing statistical surveys, but the, the in-person interviews are really important to try to better understand this. And I've just got the uh, initial results from the first um, uh, surveys and interviews that are very instructive and illuminating about uh, what it is we can do better to make sure we're retaining people. And then it's vital that uh, people be promoted, uh, that, that, that everyone in the department sees that they can aspire to hold the highest jobs in the department. And opening that process up with more transparency, especially at the senior levels, that's something we've done too. Let me just say very quickly, one of the things I'm grateful to the Congress for is for the first time we have paid internships, as you know, at the State Department. That means that socioeconomically, we widen the aperture dramatically. The enthusiasm for those has been through the roof. And based on the budget, my hope and expectation is we will get over the next couple of years to having 1,000 paid internships at the department. And that's making a huge difference. We put in place new fellowships 
that are designed uh, to um, uh, attract, uh, again, underrepresented uh, populations in the department. We just named one after Colin Powell uh, that we put together last year. We have uh, another one that I think will further diversify the core of our, dip of our diplomatic security service, which is vitally important. Anyway, it's a long way of saying there is a lot that is going on, uh, and it's something that I'm absolutely seized with. But I want to make sure that the last thing I'll say is the more we're able to institutionalize these um, initiatives so that they remain there long after you know, I'm gone and others are gone, that's usually important too. So we're looking at ways to, to do that effectively. It's tremendous work. And when it comes to naming fellowships you, after this hearing, you might want to name one after Ted Cruz. I'm sure that would <laughs> um, go a long way in bipartisan unity and support for the State Department's programs. Thank you, Senator. That's good, wise advice from a Jersey boy. <laughs>